Hello everyone and welcome to this, our last problem in module 10.2. My goodness, this is now our fourth problem looking at two population means. We've already done a previous problem that was a two-tailed test. What's different here is that now we're going to make this assumption that not only are the population standard deviations unknown, but they're also assumed unequal. What does that do? Not much, except it brings in probably the ugliest formula that you'll need up until at least this part of, of, of these problems. And we'll see uglier formulas later on, but for now, it, it doesn't change much. Uh, the only thing here is how we obtain our degrees of freedom, and it is a tedious, ugly formula, so much so that I'm going to almost skip through it. I'll show you the formula, but I'm not going to spend time calculating it because it is a little bit time consuming. Let's get into this problem. The TRU School of Business and Economics recently did a survey of alumni salaries from the past five years. The initial survey included only students in finance and economics. Uh, majors test for any difference between the two using 10% level of significance. So we are going to revisit this problem here. We're looking at just these two majors. When we get into comparing multi-populations, then we'll see how we can add more of our majors because certainly there's more than just economics and finance available. Okay, so formulate uh, formulate the test, justify our, our justification, uh, justify our formulation. So here I have um, my null and alternative. I have my two populations, economics and finance. Now, as I pointed out in the previous video, when we're looking at um, two-tailed tests, not a lot of thought has to be put into how we define those terms. It's not like a one-tailed test where the way we define those terms really determines which tail it is, an upper tail or a lower tail test. If it's a two-tailed test, it's really somewhat inconsequential. It will you know, give us either a positive or a negative test statistic, but it's not gonna change our conclusion or anything. So here we're doing this at the 10% level of significance. And once again, just for, you know, to be consistent, you can also write it like this. And again, this is only because we're using this hypothesized difference uh, of, of zero. So, oh, how do we know it's a hypothesized difference of zero? Did you just ask me that and I heard you through the YouTube? Because here we're just being asked to test for any difference. We're not being asked to test for any particular magnitude of difference. Is the, there a difference of $10,000, $5,000, $2, right? We're not testing for any magnitude of difference. It just says test for any difference. So that's how I know that our hypothesized difference here is just zero. So we've got our test, Let's um, our justification for this test is quite simple. If our evidence supports the null hypothesis, then we have no reason to believe that there is any difference in the average salary between uh, economics majors and finance majors. If our evidence supports the alternative hypotheses, now we have evidence to show that there is in fact a statistically significant difference in the average salaries between an economics major and a finance major. Good, that's that. Next, test statistic, the same as always. We put together a t-test, our hypothesized difference. Here's a little bit of a difference between um, assuming that the standard deviations are equal or not equal. If you've watched the previous videos, you know that if, if we assume that those two are equal, so if and only if, if they're equal to each other, then they're equal to some common unknown population standard deviation. Well, we needed an estimate of that. And so the estimate that we used was that pooled estimator, right? Or again, I can talk about all of these in terms of the variance. So we use this pooled estimator of that unknown population variance. Here, there's no such assumption being made. So here, our standard error is actually reliant on both 
of those sample variances. So it doesn't change, it doesn't add any complication to um, calculating that test statistic. There's no separate step in calculating that, you know, we don't have to calculate that pooled estimator. We just use um, what we have. So let's just go ahead and plug in our numbers here, 96,480 minus 94,315. Again, I'll, I'll put that hypothesized difference of zero. We all know it doesn't change anything. I'm just being very thorough. And our standard deviations here are 6340. Uh, and that's a standard deviation, so I need to square that. Divided by our sample size, which for economics was 54. And here, 6001 squared divided by that sample size 63. Now again, I always just need to point out that here I'm squaring it because I have a standard deviation. If I were given a variance, do not square it. Don't square the variance. It's already squared. So here I have the standard deviation. I do need to square it. So what is this going to give me? Let's see. I have 96,480 minus 94,315. And divide that by the standard error, 6340 squared over 54 plus 6001 squared over 63. So that gives me 1.8, let's say 1.89. That's my test statistic. Okay, that's where the fun ends. Because now the next step, of course, is our degrees of freedom. We need to know what is our, our distribution of, of relevance for this particular problem. Normally, you know, n minus 1 or n1 plus n2 minus 2. Oh, if only it were so simple. s1 squared over n1. Whoops. Plus as 2 squared over n2, all of that squared over n1, that's, oops, that's a minus s1 squared n1, squared again, 1 over n2 minus 1, s2 squared over n2, all that squared, if it makes you feel any better, I've got a cheat sheet here in front of me because this is one of those formulas. I've been teaching this course for over a decade now, and this is just one of those formulas. No matter how many times I write it down, I just will never remember it. Thankfully, I don't really need to. When we're doing work on a computer, then generally, you know, we make the computer do all the work. I don't have to worry about it. And... Normally, I tend on exams, to, if it's my students watching this, here's a bit of a clue, if it's other students watching this, I hope your instructors will do the same. But I normally avoid this type of an issue on an exam when a student is faced with a time constraint. So here you can go through this calculation just to confirm that you know how to do it, that you're able to do it. And normally you'll get some weird decimal. Well, we can't have uh, fractional degrees of freedom, so you'll round it to the nearest whole number. So you should get somewhere in the neighborhood here of 110 uh, if, you, if you go through this calculation. Now, just for comparison, if we did use the same approach that we did for the, the previous problems where we assumed that sigma was equal, which was the n1 plus n2 minus 2. Well, that would give us, what, 54 and 63 minus 2. That would give us 115. So the difference between the technically correct, accurate approach and the technically incorrect approach they're very close to each other. We're off by 5 degrees of freedom. Okay, so if we need to be really, really precise, well, we have to make sure that we do things accurately, if precision really, really matters. 
we're not actually being precise no matter what we do anyways, because I'm using the T-tables. And the T-tables lack all kinds of detail, right? When we go down to our T-tables, and I have 110 degrees of freedom, well, which one am I going to use? I'm going to use 100. Whether I have 110 degrees of freedom or I have 115 degrees of freedom, right, regardless of which calculation I just used, 110 or 115, I'm going to still be using, because we're approximating here, I'm still going to be using that 100 degrees. So again, you know, in this example, it, it works. And I'm not in any way guaranteeing that it will always work. But just be aware, if you're ever really crunched for time, and if your instructor is not giving marks for degrees of freedom calculations anyways, I'm probably giving really bad advice right now. But just be aware. Be aware of your options as far as some of these calculations and the fact that you're generally not being very accurate when you're using these t-tables anyways. Okay, enough of this bad advice. So, now I forgot what our test statistic was. What do we have? 1.89. So, I come down here, I'm looking at 100 degrees of freedom, and I'm looking for 1.89, and here I am somewhere between these two values. Here I come up to the top. You'll notice I always write these lines on here and that's really just so that I can keep track as I'm scrolling up the page. Here's my relevant probabilities, 0.05 and 0.025. Of course, if I'm you and I'm writing an exam and I'm pressured and I'm stressed and I'm looking at the clock and I say, okay, it's less than 0.05, it's more than 0.025, Okay, okay, alpha was 0.1. Oh yeah, okay, I'm way under, I'm way under that. I'm gonna reject, whew, I'm gonna reject and I'm gonna explain what that means and I'm gonna move on to the next problem. I screwed up, right? Because again, this is a two-tailed test. We can't, we can't get stuck in this routine. We can't get stuck in this habit of just going step by step by step by step by step through the process. We can't forget about these small details that make all the difference between having a right answer and having a wrong answer. This is a two-tailed test. My p-value is not 0.05. I actually didn't mean to do that. It is between 0.1 and 0.05. Okay. Well, in this case, maybe it didn't change that much anyways. I would have lost a mark because my p-value was wrong, but I guess here it doesn't actually change our conclusion. Because if my level of significance is 0.1, I'm still going to reject. Even when I have my correct p-value, it's less than 0.1, at least that doesn't change my conclusion. So in this case, it's okay. In the previous example that we just did, it made all the difference in the world. It, it crossed that barrier of that level of significance, and it went from, uh, had we made the mistake, we would have rejected the correct answer, we should not have rejected. So in that example, it did make all the difference. In this example, okay, it's not the end of the world. I screwed up on my p-value. I lost a mark on my p-value. At least the conclusion is still the same. So here I'm still going to reject. Let's go ahead and just before we go through our interpretation, uh, let's also get our critical value. So alpha here is 0.1. I'm going to come back down. And of course, we want alpha divided by 2, right? So alpha divided by 2, that's 0.05, and I'm using 100 degrees of freedom. So I'm coming down here, and so that gives me a critical value of 1.66. And once again, why not draw a picture? Here's that distribution. Critical value, 166. It's a two-tailed test, so 
we actually have plus or minus 1.66 and we will reject if we're out there, we'll reject if we're down there. Our test statistic is, what were we here, 1.89 and so of course that brings us out here where we absolutely do reject. So both our p-value approach and our critical value approach give us the same result as we would expect, yeah? So coming back here, finally, let's interpret our conclusion. So both of these um, approaches we rejected. Again, we must always get the same conclusion, regardless of which approach we use, reject the null hypothesis. So here I have evidence to show that the difference in average salary between a economics major and a finance major is statistically significant. Okay, that's it. So we've got everything. Now, I think I promised that I was going to show you how this changed if we switched those definitions. Again, because when it's a one-tail test, that makes all the difference in the world. If I switched my definitions here, what happens? Well, these get switched, right? This becomes 94,315 minus 96,480. That doesn't change really anything. I mean, okay, so these will change positions, but that doesn't change anything. All that's going to happen here is I'll have a negative test statistic. Well, if I have a negative test statistic, then here I'll have negative 189 and well it'll still fall into my rejection space right so p-value will be exactly the same as well so it doesn't really change anything meaningful okay so that's it we're good let's um how about just bonus question why don't we throw in a confidence interval because we can also confirm these results with a confidence interval as well. And we'll do it at the comparable level of significance. So we need that x bar 1 minus x bar 2 plus minus that critical value and that standard error. Right, so let's, uh, let's just punch through these calculations very quickly. So I need 96,480 minus 94,315. So that point estimate of the difference I have is 2165. Plus or minus that critical value, well, we've got that here and here is 166. And those variances I have as 6340. and 6,001 and sample sizes were 54 and 63. Okay, so let's um, let's calculate that margin of error first, 1.66 times that square root of 6340 squared over 54, oops, I need some brackets in there. 6340 squared over 54, 6001 squared over 63. So that margin of error, of course that's this term here, is 1904.29. So I add that to that point estimate. Here I have 4069. 29, and I subtract it, and I have 26, uh, 260.71. So there's that corresponding 90% confidence interval. Now, how would we interpret this? Well, there's a few different ways that we could interpret this interval. One would be to say, you know, I'm 90% confident that uh, the, the true difference in average salaries between economics and finance majors is between $260 and $4,069, right? I'm kind of rounding a little bit. 
but that gives me sort of a, a very basic um, confidence interval, a, a basic interpretation. But we can usually take it a step further because I know how that interval was calculated. I know that this is economics and this was finance, and I know that those are positive differences. So this is, again, the point estimate, and those are these uh, upper limits and, and lower limits of those estimates. So I can take this a step further because I know that this was calculated economics minus finance, and these are all positive numbers, I can say I'm 95% confident that the average salary of an economics major is between 260 dollars and four thousand and sixty nine dollars more than that of a finance major so that's it that's your bonus material because there was no confidence interval required on this problem through one in any ways because it seemed like a good fit and once again that's consistent with our results right because our results here we rejected that null hypothesis right we said no the difference is statistically different from zero well, and here we've we've really confirmed that even further. The difference is certainly different from zero. The difference is between 260 and 4,069. Okay, that's enough. The video has gone on too long. Thanks for watching, everybody. I hope this was helpful. Bye-bye.